Uh, good evening. If you have a phone right now, it would be a good time to make sure that it's on silent mode or do not disturb or whatever you need to do. You know, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to break down, a time to build up, and a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. On behalf of the family, the Gerwig family, I'd like to welcome you all this evening. My name is Alan and uh, I'm a friend of the family. Um, and uh, I also am a pastor in Northern California. Um, would you bow your heads with me as we pray and prepare to celebrate the life of Jean Gerwig? Our Lord, we acknowledge that this is a glad thing that makes you glad that we do here today. We come before you this afternoon as friends and family of Gene Gerwig. And we are here because we love him, we do miss him, and we want to cherish our memories of him. We want to honor his life and him and be support to one another, passing from life here with us to life everlasting life with you, O oh Lord. God, we thank you for Gene. You formed him, you knew him, and you walked with him through 89 years of life on this earth. And even now we have confidence that he's with you, and for that we are jealous. Thank you that you are a God of mercy and a God of comfort, both promised to us through Jesus, particularly when we lose our loved ones. And so in these moments now, and even in the weeks and months ahead, please bring that comfort and that mercy to us as we remember and share fondly all that Jean was to us in the mighty, merciful, comforting name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'd like to commend you to Carly Gerwig and her husband Matthew, Jean's granddaughter and her husband, as they lead us in song. God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting. He makes me lie down so green by its streams. When I walk, through the valleys with death and dying I will not fear for you are with me you're always with me the shepherd staff comforts me all my feast in the presence of enemies surely goodness will follow me follow me in the house of 
God forever. We went to West Virginia and we flew into Columbus, Ohio and couldn't take our, collect, our connecting flight because it was so snowed in. So my dad and I were on this bus and I remember it had a hole in the floorboard and was blowing slush in and we're getting all wet and dirty but it was beautiful, the beautiful countryside all through there and we're looking at rolling hills all covered with, with snow. And my dad turns to me and he says, he goes, you know, I feel kind of bad because we're going to my dad's funeral but this is really good to be with you. This is really fun. And I would encourage you, you know, I wrote down, uh, Alan is uh, my brother, and he and I wrote down on our Harleys yesterday, just, and I felt, oh, I'm going to my dad's funeral. I probably should not enjoy this. Uh, yeah, I shouldn't be enjoying this beautiful sunshed. I shouldn't be enjoying this 
beer and these fish and chips and riding with my buddy and breaking the speed limit. I shouldn't be, but I was. And I would encourage you, my father, uh, like there was, I was, there was no way I was gonna wear a suit today because my dad wouldn't have done it. He was a casual guy. Um, he would not want to have a very solemn, sad moment. I miss my dad every day. But you know what? He would want us to celebrate. And if you knew my dad, you knew he, he just loved life and he had a great life. So we're going to share some thoughts with you, but I just want you to know, you know, it's, there's always a tension at funerals where um, as a pastor, I get to do a lot of them. I get to. Um, and there's this tension like, is it okay to laugh? Should we, if, you know, if, we, if he had a, a day where nobody laughed and nobody cried, he'd be bombed. So if you're feeling really sad, try to feel less sad. <laughs> because he would want us to enjoy our time together. So Andrew's going to talk. I've known Chuck's dad since I was 17 when Chuck and I started dating. And no, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago that was. Uh, <clears throat> I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> dad accepted me into his family right away with open arms. I started calling him dad shortly after that. I don't even remember, you know, that I called him Gene. It's just weird. So I always called him dad. When I was thinking about what I was going to share about dad, um, I really realized that he was a generous, loving man that had an amazing sense of humor. Um, every holiday, I would make sweet potatoes and do uh, marshmallows on top of the sweet potatoes and put it into the broiler, and it never failed. I caught that on fire every year, my family knows. And dad, <laughs> dad would come and say, I'll get it, and he'll he got the sweet potatoes out of the oven with his hooks, but he wasn't just getting the sweet potatoes out. He'd say, hot, hot, ouch, ouch, ouch. And the list was... <laughs> Seriously, he always made us laugh. <laughs> yeah. He loved his beautiful wife. They were West Virginia country and New York City. They had a unique, sweet relationship. They were best friends, and they took care of each other. And near the end of mom's life, when she got ill, dad took care of her. He did all the cooking, all the cleaning, and he did whatever he could to take care of her, to make sure she was comfortable. And it was so sweet to see how much he loved mom. He loved Chuck and was so proud of him. He loved his grandchildren, Billy, Donna, Ina, Carly, and Jesse. They all loved playing at his house. And I don't know if you remember, Donna, that cardboard box that was in the dining room. Were Girls? We, were we not poor that yeah, all they had? All, <laughs> the toys were always in this cardboard box. And I don't know, it was the same toys for decades. I don't know if Chuck played with them and then the grandkids. and. And it was always in the cardboard box. Until Dad moved out of the house, it was still the cardboard box. <laughs> um, and they just had a lot of fun being around um, Dad and Mom. And then when Noah and Ezra were born, he was so excited that he got to meet them. Because he was really afraid that he wouldn't be here. And he was so excited. And he kept telling me, oh, you're going to experience all the firsts. And it's going to be so fun. And he's, he's like, man, I'm not going to be able to see them have jello. <laughs> and he's like, that's going to be awesome. <laughs> and he was just really, really loved them. He was also very proud to be born and raised in West Virginia. He loved his family from West Virginia. And I remember when Chuck and I were newly married, and dad and mom took us out to West Virginia. And we got the tour, I got the tour of West Virginia, Chuck knew, he's been there many times when he was younger. But he gave me the tour and there was always stories with every place that he would show. This is where I grew up, this is where I went to school. And this is where my girlfriend lived, and that's this. where my girlfriend lived. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell my girlfriend over here about that girlfriend over there. Yeah. I know, recently, when we had a family reunion just a couple of years ago, when Carly and Jesse and all of us went, and they were like, Appa, you dated a lot of girls. <laughs> and uh, so it was just, that was one of our special trips 
always going. And then when the, kid, the kids were little, dad bought an RV, and so we would actually go cross country to West Virginia to our family reunions. And that was just, we had so many memories and it was just so fun. But one thing that really stands out about Dad, well, he's such a humble man. I mean, he really downplayed everything in his life. He was just, you know, it was like no big deal to him. No big deal that, you know, he manages to learn how to use hooks and not only use them, but he was painting pictures with hooks and he cooked and he cleaned and he took care of the house and he did everything that anyone else could do. Except he couldn't do one thing without putting his lenses in his eye. <laughs> and so we all got really good at that, especially Jessie, because she did a lot. <laughs> and, but he, he, if, even if he couldn't do something, he would figure it out, and it would maybe take him an hour or two longer than it would take us, but he would figure it out, and he would make it happen. And he always said that he just, he, he just felt like an ordinary man who was blessed by God, and he always said he had a great life and always said that he, his family brought him so much joy. But in fact, he was an exceptional man and dad was the one who brought us great joy in our lives. And I will miss him greatly. Thanks for sharing, honey. So my dad was a, a unique guy and uh, our relationship was unique. Uh, because, you know, most people, their parents aren't home all the time. I grew up uh, much of my life here in Newbury Park, and my dad was home every day. Uh, when I was a young kid who lived in Santa Monica, my dad was home every day. And so my dad was like, he was like my partner and everything. He was like my coach and everything. You know, whether it was helping with homework or whether it was learning to throw baseball, he was a really attentive dad. He was a great, great dad. He was always funny, he always laughed, he always wanted to devote himself to whatever would be a blessing to me. Uh, and I recognized very early on that his life was about making my life great. And uh, boy, it's a wonderful thing to have somebody in your life like that. Their goal is to make your life great and to make you a great person. And, uh, and he failed on the great person, but my life has been super fun. And, uh, and thanks a lot to my dad. So we've had this really unique relationship um, of closeness and uh, as I grew up and got older my dad had needs because he was handicapped there were things that he couldn't do and he needed help with and as he got even older in the last several years he needed even more help moved up to Santa Cruz we tried to get him to move in with us but he was such an independent cuss he was like no way I'm not moving in I want my own space you'll drive me crazy <laughs> and he said Andrew will drive me crazy no, <laughs> and so he lived like five minutes from us and, but he needed lots and lots more help uh, in these last years and allowed me to kind of repay this attentiveness to make, uh, I learned my job is to make my wife's life great by his example and my daughter's lives great by his example and then to make his life great in these last few years. So it's really a um, mixed bag for me today and I miss him a lot. I'm really trying not to cry. Um, because he would hate that. And, um, but, uh, man, his life was an amazing life. He was an exceptional guy. I've, you know, done lots of funerals and been at lots of funerals. That's what I do for a living. And um, part of what I do for a living. And um, I know everybody's special, but he was a unique guy. Not because he was burned up, but because of the way that he rebounded from that. And the way God used that in the lives of everybody he was around. It's an amazing guy. In 1953, May 15th, he was in a car accident. If you don't know his story, uh, it was an extreme accident. He was burned over 95% of his body. They didn't expect him to live. He had really no ex life expectancy at all. He didn't only survive it, but he just kept rehabilitating himself and rehabilitating himself. And, and he met this nurse. And he started dating this nurse, and then they got married, and then they had me, and then they got a giant poodle named Fifty because a boy needs a giant poodle. And, uh, and then, of course, he had a pet monkey. 
And so he had this really kind of, he just made his life what he wanted it to be and moved to Santa Monica and, uh, and just blessed me. And this accident really didn't define him. Uh, it was just uh, part of his life. Uh, he was an amazing dad. And like I said, he was involved with everything in, in my life. Uh, when I got into motorcycles, he was the guy who was like, oh, buy that motorcycle, all funded. Uh, he said, oh, you know, you can, that uh, motorcycle for the last one I bought, this, my dad was a very generous person. He didn't really have use for money. He grew up in West Virginia, he grew up poor, and so he didn't need a lot of money, but he really wanted to have his money make uh, my life, Andrew's life, the kid's life great. So I, uh, I ended up buying this motorcycle. And uh, I said, hey, Dad, can you finance it for me? He goes, yeah, I'll tell you what, how about 100 bucks a month? It's going to be a good deal because I'm going to die before you ever pay a thing off. <laughs> I was like, sold. And uh, so I buy this motorcycle, and uh, about three months into the car, uh, the motorcycle payments, I send him a check, and he goes, oh, hey, take your check back. It's all paid off. And I go, how's my motorcycle paid off? It's like $300. And he goes, my book shows it's paid off. <laughs> it's just the way he was. You know, he just... Um, you know, one day he told me, you know, the way that God is going to provide for you as a minister and the way he's going to provide for your family is he's going to provide through me. And I'm going to help you in ways that 45 and 50 year old people don't get help from their family. And you need to have the humility to take it. And uh, he was a very generous, supportive, wonderful dad. Now, later in life, we got the opportunity to do road trips. He loved to travel and wasn't able to do all those things on his own. And so what we ended up doing was just saying, hey, Dad, I'm going here. You want to come with me? And so my dad got to go to Israel twice with me. And we had these amazing trips there. And he got to go to Italy a couple of times and road trip in a, a rented minivan around uh, Europe, Central and Eastern Europe for a while. And he's been to Hungary and Austria and Romania. Uh, but what he liked as much as anything is, like Andrew mentioned, he bought these motorhomes. He'd go, I'll buy a motorhome. I'll pay the gas if Andrew will cook and we'll just drive around through your whole vacation. Drive. I always wanted to go across America. And we had these amazing trips. When I was a, I worked at this church as a youth pastor for 10 years. Some of my, some of my old students are here. They're all wrinkly and fat and bald like me now. It's, uh, it's sweet seeing you get old. I'm just telling you, it's kind of funny. Uh, we would be, when I was working, I remember we'd go on vacation, and my dad and I would be in the motorhome driving through Kansas or something, listening to music, the kids would be playing video games in the back, and Andrew would be making like margaritas and nachos, and we'd drink and drive, and that's what you passed us to on vacation. And my dad was so happy. He was so happy. He just loved that stuff. He loved his grandkids, loved his family. And uh, so it was really fun to make some of his dreams come true, to go do things with him that uh, he wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. He had a dog named Gypsy, who like, was the crypt keeper. He was like 22 years old when he died. It was blind. It was weird. Uh, but he loved that dog. Uh, he loved my mom. He loved me. He had these barbecues on Thursday nights with a bunch of his buddies. And it was the greatest thing in his life. We moved from here and went to, to Northern California. And when we did, my I was really wondering how that was going to work for my dad, because he didn't want to come. He wanted to stay here. And uh, some of you, like Bob Dylan's here and Donald Craddock's here, some of you, uh, the McCombs, would go to his house and help him and do stuff and, and come over and just hang out with him. Donald Craddock became his best friend. Uh, and he would always say, Donald's my best friend. And they would sit and smoke cigars and drink scotch and have barbecue. And uh, his life was made rich by this community. And we were really thankful. Uh, he was an unstoppable man. You know, I used to say death couldn't kill him. And uh, when we were, went to the hospital most recently with him, and I left and I thought, you know what, I don't think he's going to come back this time. And uh, even the other night, last night I was talking with a friend and he said, hey, what happened? How did your dad die? And what happened was my dad, he didn't want anybody to worry, he didn't want to make anybody upset or concerned, so he didn't mention to anybody but he had three different kinds of unrelated cancer on top of all of his other stuff. You know, he had arthritis and he had some, some problems walking and with his balance and the cancer made it worse. And he ended up getting lung cancer, it came back, they gave him chemo and after about five weeks of chemo, he had gotten very, very weak. He'd gotten very weak. Uh, he was losing his eyesight at the end and they were preparing him to go to blind school because they said you gotta learn how to now also navigate without being able to see. And, and the quality of his life was waning. He was very, very tired. And uh, I took him to the hospital. 
was really struggling to breathe, and they just said, hey, Gene, you know, it's not looking good. There's not much more we can do for you. And he goes, well, we can go to the second round of chemo. You know, he's like a super, you know, and he's so sick from the chemo. I'm like, if it were me, I would say just, you know, let's not do that. Um, and uh, he was like, well, we could just go with this next. And they said, Gene, we can't, we can't give you any more chemo. And he said, oh, okay, well, then just make me comfortable and I'll go. He goes, I've had a great life. That was one of the last words was, I've had a great life. I'm ready to go. And so we stayed there in the hospital, and about a week later, he um, started to have more and more problems breathing, and they made him comfortable, and I spent about 18 hours with him at the hospital, and uh, then um, about the middle of the afternoon on uh, November 7th, he, uh, he shrugged his shoulders a couple times, and I went over and said, hey, Dad, are you comfortable? And he had been unresponsible all morning, just been asleep. I said, are you comfortable? And he had kind of a smile, and he went, But like he said, you know, um, he said, I've had a great life. I'm, I'm ready to go. And he felt really content uh, with the life that he'd had. And you're going to hear more about that even in his own words. And the theme of his life was life can be good if you let it be. Stuff rolls into our life that we can't uh, can't do anything about. Uh, but he really he really chose. To, sorry, you know, it's hard to talk. Uh, I do this for a living too. Every morning when I get up to preach on Sunday, I cry like this. <laughs> uh, uh, it is hard to talk about people you love, you know, when you miss them. Because here's a, here's the dichotomy, right? As Christians, you go, man, the best thing in the world is to be in paradise. Jesus says, when you die, you are with me in paradise as of right now. I know that's true. It's not just we can see and now he has hands. Oh, man, that's so, that's so yesterday's news, you know? And what it is is he's entered into paradise with Christ. So who wants to say, wants to say, oh, I wish I could keep him here. Here? Really? Have you seen the news lately? <laughs> you know? So I am thrilled for my dad. You know, and I know that to be the truth. He had a very simple, very simple faith. He believed that there was a God who made him, who loved him, who allowed things to happen in his life, but that who wanted him to overcome those things and would be with him until the day he breathed his last, and then he would be in paradise with him. And that's what he believed. I believe it's the truth also. So I want to thank you for coming today. There's a, some people are going to share. You're going to hear some audio from uh, an interview I did with him, uh, a sermon I did about eight years ago or ten years ago. And, um, and I also want to say thank you to all the people that, that serve here at the bridge who have been long-term friends who invited us to be able to use this place and have worked to get it all ready and set up. And um, I feel really humbled by your friendship and I'm really thankful for it. So again, my dad would want you to uh, my dad would want you to recognize that life can be good if you let it be, and a lot of that has to do with just choosing to recognize the little blessings that happen in your life every day, regardless of the external circumstances. It's the theme of his life, and you'll hear more from other people about that in just a moment. Uh, and now, uh, Carly and Jesse Gerwig, Chuck and Andrew's daughters. And Jean's granddaughters. Your turn. All right, guys, I'm going to try and get through this without weeping. Yeah. <laughs> Carly said she'll do some dancing for me if I start crying. So. <laughs> All right, so my sister and I were blessed to have two incredible grandfathers. Abba was the most beautiful example of overcoming all odds and living life, life to its last drop. He taught me to overcome any obstacle that came my way and to not take life too seriously. Even though, even through the hardest moments, Abba was most likely cracking jokes and making those around him laugh. He really brought joy to every moment. As a little girl, Abba was my buddy. He carried me around everywhere we went, and I was his little sidekick. He was truly a family man. <laughs> he was truly a family man. He loved us deeply. He wanted to make sure we were all taken care of. He was always present for me and very involved in my life. <laughs> he helped me buy my first car. He gave
gave me boy advice and encouraged me along the way in my career. He truly gave more in life than he took. It seemed as though he knew everyone in town growing up. We would go on walks to Pepper Tree Park with his pup, he would call him Jip or, yeah, Jippy, call her Jippy, um, saying hi to everyone along the way. He was incredibly relational. Um, fast forward to when I turned 19, I had a job <coughs> offer down here, um, and he opened up his home to me. Um, it even gave me the master bedroom. <laughs> um, but we had the best of times together. Um, in the two years, he grew me into the woman that I am today. He would eat my cooking even when it wasn't good, <laughs> never complaining. Um, and even when I was trying to be healthy, he would eat my, as you call it, rabbit food. Um, but we did everything together. Um, we went to doctor's appointments and grocery shopping, lunch dates, and um, would have a lot of late nights watching um, funniest home videos and Shark Tank, and we would just laugh for hours. Um, I would always ask him about his life, and I especially wanted to hear about his love story with Anna. Um, he would say that he lived the most amazing and full life. Um, he got to travel the world, he had the love of his life um, and his family around him. He was the most strong-willed man you'd ever meet. Um, there was one night I came home from work and the TV was on and the chair was knocked over and he was nowhere to be found and I freaked out and <laughs> called my parents and he had the neighbor take him to the hospital for something and um, Daniel Aspinwall took me into the hospital and as I like walked in I started bawling and he's like, what's wrong? I was like, I thought someone stole you. <laughs> and he was like, who would steal me, Jesse? And yeah, he comes in with him and I was like, in my mind he's just so special. I was like, someone took him. <laughs> but Abba was my person and I miss him dearly. Um, but I know he would be really honored today. Thank you for coming to celebrate his life. Are you gonna dance for me? <laughs> I might start crying for sure. Um, on the little card that everyone got, it said, um, world-class grandfather. And um, Jesse and I's grandmas passed away when we were pretty young. And so Appa and my Teta became like something extra, kind of like both grandma and grandpa on one. Um, and I always thought Appa was a superhero when I was young, and it wasn't because he looked different. I actually didn't realize he didn't have hands till I was three or four, and um, he used to pick me up when I went to elementary school here at Walnut um, in first and second grade, and I would go to his house after when we would walk together, and I remember just wanting everyone to meet him. I would introduce him to the crossing guard and all my friends. And uh, he always liked to tell a story where all my friends would be like, what's, what's wrong with your grandpa? What's wrong with him? And I would just say, oh, it's just Appa. I didn't understand that there was anything different about him. To me, he was just super special. And I thought everyone should know him. And kind of everyone did. We would always be walking around. People would, hey, Gene. And um, it was like being with a celebrity. He was just super special. And I know now that he's not a superhero, but there was a lot of things that he was really super at. Um, and so one of them was making fun of me. It was kind of <laughs> the nature of our relationship and how he told me he loved me all the time. Um, and so his two favorite stories were, one, there's a big magnolia tree he has in his backyard and I would climb it a lot as a kid. And one day I got stuck really high up and I'd been calling for him, Appa, Appa, for what felt like a long time. And when he came out to check on me, he's like, oh my gosh, Appa, I've been here for years. Where have you been? <laughs> And he loved telling that one. And then also, um, we were at McDonald's when I was really little. I had a cold and I was eating some ice cream. And um, he always ate my leftover food. I always had leftover food around and he was like my personal garbage disposal because he didn't want to waste. And so he had asked me a bunch, okay, are you sure you're done? Are you sure? I was like, yeah, yeah. And then as soon as he started eating it, I cried and screamed, he's eating my ice cream, he's eating it. He was so embarrassed, and um, he also <laughs> also caught the cold I had from eating that. <laughs> um, he was a super adventure buddy, so like my parents said, we would go on these cross-country road trips, stop in all these states, do all these amazing things. Um, one of my favorites is my dad and me and him went climbing in some Mayan ruins, and I was way too young to be up there. and. He didn't have hands, it was just, he would do it. He would just go on all adventures with us. And um, wonderful. 
and um, he would eat, I would make apple pie for him all the time, and one time I substituted some lemon juice for limes, and I put a ton of it in there, and it was so sour and so gross, and he would eat it all and say it was so amazing. Um, just totally love without, yeah, love and support. Um, uh, when I first met Matthew, um, I just met him and moved away to college, um, and I called him, and, um, you know, I was saying, oh, up, I met someone, I think I'm going to marry him, and he's like, oh, honey, I bet he's wonderful. If you picked him, he must be wonderful, and um, he just supported us and was so much a part of our life, um, and he was a super great grandpa to the boys, just loved them, so they were the best babies, cutest babies, funniest babies, just, <laughs> again, support. Um, yeah, just thank you for being here. Um, I know that when you have loved ones, you think they're special and super, and it's so great to see other people uh, who knew him and knew how special he was. And Appa, we super <clears throat> miss you, super love you, and we can't wait to see you. Donald Craddock, Gene's best friend has some things to share. Here you go, my friend. Actually, it's funny. I feel like uh, he was my best friend. But uh, I first got to know Gene 17 years ago. He was laid up, and uh, Chuck asked my little boys and I to take care of his lawn for a little while. And after the first few visits, my uh, oldest, William, who was 10, said, um, at first, uh, you know, Dad, at first, when I met Mr. Gerwig, all I could see were his impairments, but now I don't see it at all. And, and it really just said a huge amount uh, for his life, that, that with his charm, with his uh, humor, uh, with his kindness, he could win the heart of little boys. And, and uh, then, you know, over the years, I didn't really have that much necessarily interaction with Gene, uh, the occasional taking a meal to him, uh, smoking a cigar in the garage of Mark and April and, and uh, things like that. But then um, it was five years ago that the nature of our relationship really just changed totally. Uh, I had went into a, uh, an adversity in my own life that, um, that was extreme and dark, really. And, and God seemed silent to me. And it was then that Gene's life and his message um, and his friendship really ministered to me. Um, at first, it was you know taking long drives up to Santa Cruz, you know road trips and talking and uh, running errands together. Uh, then Sergey and I started doing the, the barbecues, which was a ton of fun. And and um, you know he would dazzle us with his magic powers, sticking the hooks into the flames of the oven and what have you. <laughs> Whoa! And um, really, his joy, his simple pleasures, his. Um, his value of friendship and his dwelling on goodness and really overlooking adversity himself. Uh, one of one of our sometimes visitors, Emma, to the to the barbecues, who was interestingly enough uh, 53 years younger than Gene and really enjoyed his uh, friendship and company. It, I was talking to her on the phone and she said, um, basically summed it up. He had everything in the world to bitch about and did, and. And uh, I, I, there's uh, uh, one experience, there's uh, quite a few experiences that kind of punctuate the, the, uh, his values. Uh, one of them was, uh, Chuck was Chuck's band was having a gig up in Santa Cruz, so we're you know, making plans, and okay, I'll pick you up at such and such a time. Uh, well, um, oh, you gotta pick me up later, well why? Well, I have, a, you know, I have this medical thing going on. Okay, well, Dave comes around and I pick him up, and, so how, uh, what did the doctors do? Uh, well, put in a new pacemaker. <laughs> is, that, is that big or do they cut you for that? Oh yeah, can I see? And, and so he takes the shirt off and lifts up the gauze and holy smokes, Gene, that is, you know, incision. It looked like a monster uh, red-legged centipede going across him. And he's like, come on, let's go. We're gonna get on the road. We're gonna miss the concert. We're late already. And, uh, and as we're driving down the road, uh, after a little while, Gene's body just goes, like this, his legs stick out of the floorboard, and whoa. 
Uh, what was that, Gene? Oh, I think the pacemaker's acting up. <laughs> oh. And I'm, uh, oh, shouldn't we do something about it? We've got to get, Chuck's got the project tonight. We're going to miss it if we don't even gun it. And, and so I'm trying to text Chuck while driving. Your dad, looking like someone's nailing him with a taser gun, you know, every so often. Pull over, you know, make phone calls, get this fixed. And so I pull over. What are you doing? Well, I got to call your doctor. What's your doctor's name? And I'm trying to, you know, get the equipment. No one's around. No one's available. Gene says, you might as well be driving while you're doing this. <laughs> and we're going to miss Chuck's, you know, Chuck's uh, gig. And so we keep going down the road with every few minutes him just lurching out. Can you hold my cell phone and charge it? Because, you know, we're too many phone calls. And, and Chuck's getting angry as we're going. Gene's saying, Get up there, and Chuck saying, "Pull over," and, you know, turn around, and, and then Chuck says, "Get over to the Santa Cruz, the main hospital there. You got to go into the emergency room." So we go in there, and you, I don't know, if you can imagine that place. It was like 40, 50 people, you know, tripping and bleeding and broken uh, stuff. With, you know, police custody and and yeah, it was it was a war zone. But Gene's first response is, these people need help more than I do. <laughs> We're going to miss Chuck's cop, you know, Chuck's band. And so we couldn't, we, we, he actually just said, let's get out of here. I mean, let's get out of here. He was getting angry, so like, okay. And we go to the concert, we have a fun evening, you know, light our cigars on him. <laughs> do you like this? And, uh, and actually, it just said a lot, you know, that his main thing was he wanted to enjoy, you know, Chuck, the, the hanging out, the, the fun, you know, having some beers and the chit-chatting and everything. And um, really, even the next day, we finally did round up a technician. The, the technician comes over to his house and, and uh, you know, folds out her laptop. And, and we're apologizing for the cigars and the single malt scotch and everything. And she, <laughs> Don't apologize, this is the most fun call I've ever been on. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think that really, that was the whole thing with Gene that I, I really enjoyed, is that, that he, his value of friendship, his value of living in the moment, um, you know, he certainly had plenty to deal with. And uh, yeah, and, uh, one of my favorite things he said over and over, uh, good friends, good food, good cigar, you know, what more could a person ask for? And, Really, I, I felt like that was a, a true statement, you know, for what a way to live. Thanks. Joel Gorwig, sir, we would like to commend you to the floor. This is Gene's nephew. This out of the way. All the way from Austin. Yeah. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, I'm really light on my feet, you can tell. <laughs> there you go, sir. Thank you. Um, I was supposed to stay, sit up here by myself and basically tell you about Uncle Gene. Um, but like us Gerwigs, every once in a while we can be very unpredictable. So <laughs> what I did was uh, I brought my father up, which was Uncle Gene's brother, and then I brought my older brother up here uh, as well to kind of give their spiel. My dad certainly can give you some insight on some of the things that you all wouldn't know about uh, Gene. So uh, anyway, I'm gonna turn it over to him first, what's it, they say age before beauty. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Jack. Uh, Gene was a year and a half uh, younger than me. I have an older brother that's a year and a half older than me. So three kids uh, try to get them to work together or play together is a tough, tough job. But we had a tough mom. And Gene, being the youngest, uh, would always get picked on by either me or my older brother. And he would run to my mother, and she'd say, go get a switch. Do any of you know what a switch is? 
stick about that long you cut off a tree. And the, if you had long pants on, she made you pull your pants down. If you had your short pants on, then she would switch those things with that switch. Well, on one occasion, my older brother and I were, uh, had picked on the younger brother, Gene, and uh, so we, uh, mother, our mother told us to go get a switch, bring it in. Ed and I were standing there waiting in line to get it, pay the dues. And uh, he looked over to his mother and he says, Mom he says, I hate to hear Jack cry. Why don't you pay, why don't you punish me twice and let him go? Uh, that, that's a real brother. A uh, second incident that I remember, uh, this, this is all early, early stuff, uh, when he was in the hospital in Philadelphia. And his home for eight years there was a hospital bed in that particular uh, unit. Anyway, a lot of the work that had to be done on him was transfer uh, skin uh, to uh, another place in his body to cover up the scar tissue. And most of it was done on his face. Well, they ran out of skin to transfer, so they, they, they had some back on his butt. And he said, uh, said they would transfer it to his arm, and they'd bring the arm, cut it off, bring the arm up here, and transfer it back to his face. And uh, so they come in, and Gene says, well, uh, if you kiss my cheek, Cheek, you know what you're kissing, don't you? <laughs> Thank you. Don't think of yourself. Think of everybody else. It's a bit and uh, it, it, uh, if you get uh, here in the morning and go out, uh, well, first thing he'd say it was, uh, what are we going to do today? Never, never did I ever hear him, you know, why me? Why me? What have I done to solve that? All the time he was always thinking of somebody else that was in worse condition than he was. And uh, the... Uh, uh, well, I lost my train of thought there for a little while, but I'll get it back. <laughs> uh, another incident, and I, don't, I should have written these down, uh, but I'm not going to uh, say it anymore. I just wanted to say uh, he was one of the top guys in the whole world. Best brother? Well, I can't say that. <laughs> uh, he was a terrific brother. <laughs> and, uh, I guess the only thing I can say is I, I, I sure do miss him. Uh, I'm going to hand this over to my older brother, Jack. Uh, I guess it's mischief before beauty on this one. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Honoriness, no doubt. What Uncle Gene meant to me. Well, I tell you what, I probably came farther than anybody to this. He meant that much to me. Uh, I, I think I'll go back to maybe when I was about 16 years old. No, a little bit farther back than that. I can recall his visits in West Virginia, and of course, being the oldest of his nephews, I uh, got to guess gain all those great things that he's passed to all of you all out here. You know, I looked at his life and the troubles and the strives and the obstacles and all those things would make most people just give up. But he had a spirit that was just second to none. You know, if I ever came to him with something that I thought was a really a big time problem, <laughs> he'd say, hey, that ain't nothing <laughs> compared to what I've gone through. 
And what I, he had gone through, he never spoke of as being something that was an achievement or something that was special. It was just the way he wanted to live life, I guess. Uh, life was a challenge for him, and he challenged every challenge. You know, uh, my career was uh, in sales. Maybe one of the things you don't know about Uncle Gene was he, in fact, was a salesperson. He used to sell, I believe it was sweepers. What was it? Goodwill. Good. Oh, I know, but he had sweepers, though. I think he sold to somebody at one time. Vacuum cleaner. He was a vacuum cleaner salesman. And I figured, well, if he can do it, I can too. He must have been a darn good one, because I know that I was a darn good one. He, he, he had something that ripped off on me to excel at what I did and retire early. But um, some of the other things that I'd like to share with you about him, you know, I didn't write anything down. I figured, well, it'll just come to me. He always had a joke. You know, I can remember many, uh, a time that we would talk all night long. He was always interested in what you had to say. We would talk all night long until the sun came up. And I, that kind of separated him from all the rest of my uncles, is that no other uncle that I had stayed up all night long till the sun came up talking with you. And we discussed so many different things in life. And I'm so grateful that I got to spend the time that I got to spend with him. Because there's just so many things that in my own life, in the obstacles that I've had to uh, overcome. I mean, I'm a cancer survivor. I've just really, it's not been quite a year that I, I couldn't even talk. <laughs> I had uh, cancer of the vocal cords. My treatments were at the end of uh, March of this past year. So it hadn't even been a year. And just to be able to talk to you all is a miracle. Because I could not squeak out nothing. And I think it was part of his prayers, prayer, praying for me to get better is why I got better. I knew he was always with me. I was holding his great grandson there and he, it's just like Uncle Gene reincarnated. He was right there with me. You know, I could imagine him looking like a baby just like Ezra is now. And I'm so glad that he had so many friends that I look upon all y'all that it showed up today. He was truly a special person. I don't know anybody that's in my family that's ever been in the movies, but Uncle Gene was. Uh, I don't know anybody in my family that has had prosthesis and when he was getting ready to be jumped by some people in the Bronx that put him up and said, come on, you want some of this? <laughs> He became a good friend, Uncle Gene's, believe it or not. <laughs> you know, I remember him telling me that story. And I said, Jeepers, you know, he, he had no fear. He had no fear whatsoever. And I think when he left this world, he had no fear in doing that either. Because he sure didn't have any fear all the time he was in it. And I feel so blessed that he has been with me these almost been almost 68 years. <laughs> Gosh, it's how time flew by so quickly. His favorite uh, name for me, though, especially in my youth, <laughs> was Weisenmeyer. I hadn't heard that term come up, but I was his little Weisenmeyer. And I don't know if you all did. Did you ever hear him use that term, Weisenmeyer? That was nice. <laughs> yeah, I, guess it was. I didn't hear what he said behind my back. 
I know my Aunt Lou, though, she always took up for me. <laughs> His wife, uh, you know, I have to remember her a little bit. She was my favorite aunt. Um, I wear something that she wore ever since she passed away and I've had around my neck ever since she passed away. And um, it was something that Uncle Gene gave me and I'm glad that he did. My younger brother probably got to spend more time with him really than I did. I know that he helped him on a lot of projects around the house. And I know they had a lot of deep discussions because my brothers had to overcome a lot of, throughout his life, uh, the, the same kind of debilitating things that Uncle Gene did. And to see him come up here and walk up on these two canes today, I, I just saw him this past summer, it's just unreal. So there was something special, I think, that Uncle Gene has passed on to all the generations that came down after him. And we're living examples sitting right here on this stage, my brother and I. Miss, I'm going to turn over to you, Mr. Joel. Joe Barrett's Jim. <laughs> well, I got to let you all know, the time they had to prepare was probably about five miles from here. <laughs> because I didn't tell them until we got on the road in the car that they were gonna come up here with me. So it will be a little sneaky, but you know, I wanted it you know, out there kind of raw. Don't, don't prepare for it, so. Uh, he was my Uncle Gene. And I did know him in a different way than most people. Um, as my brother said, we both kind of had, uh, I like to think of it as being special, sort of, and challenges. Um, that's one thing that was a common bond between us and that we could talk about amongst ourselves, that we didn't have to hold anything back. Um, we would joke about it. We would do things, I mean, a handicapped space was a handy cripple spot for us. <laughs> uh, but him and I, he, he gave me the, the start, actually, when I got out of school uh, at a very young age. Uh, my dad sent me out here. I, we all did come out and see Uncle Gene. I was just the only one that stayed. <laughs> in fact, I did go home 10 years later. Well, I left 10 years later. Um, but he opened his home to me, uh, and he actually started my life out um, as far as my career was concerned. Um, he was always behind me. Um, I had some tough things happen when I was here in California that kind of set me back, but he was always there to boost me up. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about his sense of humor, um, how he put a smile on his face. Um, and those are all great things, but to him, he was an inspiration to me on the amount of strength that he had. And those were the type of things that really him and I could bond on. And I, I don't know that I really offered anything to him, uh, but certainly he had a lot to offer to me. And even, you know, at some of the lowest points, you know, I was, I had to just think about him, not what he went through or anything, just think about him, you know, and it would make me not like 100%, but it sure made me feel a lot better than I felt. Um, I was, I was his handyman, okay, around the house, and the main jobs, it took three hours than anybody I've ever met in my life. Um, he used to tell me, I could just remember one funny story he used to tell me. He told me over and over, but I still laughed every time I heard it. When he was living in New York City, he was down in Grand Central Station. And, you know, this was after he burned, he had his hooks and everything. And he just got a fresh cup of co coffee. You know, down Grand Central Station, there was a bunch of panhandlers around. 
So anyway, he's standing there in the sink with his fresh cup of coffee, and some guy comes and tosses a quarter into it. <laughs> made me laugh about every time. I mean, I've heard that one a bunch of times, but still, it was funny. But nevertheless, every time I heard it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and it's true. Uh, as a lot of people would attest, he could do anything. He could do anything except there was one thing that he couldn't do. And that was, you know that little tab in your zipper? You know, most of the time it points up right and just grab it and go, well, one time it was pointing down and then his fly was all the way down. And he was telling me in kind of a roundabout way that he needed some help getting his zipper up. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, I kind of look, I looked at the situation, surveyed it, and thought about, you know, as an engineer, tried to engineer the best possible way of doing that. Well, here I found myself out in the garage, on my knees, with a pair of needle nose pliers <laughs> right down in his crotch, you know, trying to flip this thing and zip it up. And we thought to ourselves, and we joked about this like, boy, if anybody could have ever saw us doing this. <laughs> Thank goodness, you know, it's not like today or that would have gone. That's something that would have gone viral. <laughs> you know, so. But anyway, uh, I love him a lot. He was, uh, he was like my second dad. And um, we, the, the time we had was short at 10 years, but you know, he was always there for me. And, and you know, they always say that there, people are with you because they're in your heart, you know, and, and and that's certainly not an understatement. He's got a good piece in my heart, and and it's, you know, I get when we get together and we talk, and those people that have those pieces from him in their hearts, when we get together, it's just like putting him together whole, you know, and and I guess I don't know. To me, that's what he really left behind them was special, is that, you know, whenever you get together, all you have is laughter, okay? And, and it takes a special man to, to do that, pull that off. So anyway, I just, I just wanted to thank, be thankful just being up here and get to share just a little bit of of me with you all and, and my experience uh, with Uncle Gene. In 2010, Gene um, made the trek up to Santa Cruz, California, uh, where Chuck had asked him to come up and to share his story and his testimony and offer it up to the congregation there at Elevation Church. Um, but even more than that, I think what, and equally as important, was that they were able to capture uh, in his own words uh, his story uh, and his testimony uh, uh, with respect to a life well lived. And so while we can't play for you the full 60 minutes, we would like to offer up to you Gene Gerwig in his own words and a four minute excerpt from that testimony. <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, as you think about the kind of junk that, that came into your life out of nowhere, um, after dealing with people for the last 25 years of, of ministry, you know, I mean, when things happen, even sometimes smaller things, people are like, God, I'm really angry at you. Why me? Why did you do this to me? Why me? You know, I was trying to figure out, you ever ask why me? It never entered my mind. Uh, it, 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 it was me. Nothing is going to do is change it. That is, until you ask me that, of why me, uh, it's never really entered my mind as to, as to why I made it. It's, 
I can say it is what it is, and uh, there's nothing you can do to change it. You can't blame it on somebody else. And if I wish or to wish it on somebody else, who do I hate enough that I would want to wish it on, you know? So uh, I would never think of it. Never mad at God about it? No. Uh, why would I be mad at God? You know, I don't think it's God's fault. That it's just that uncommon. Just it's just that, that it's just, uncommon. Just because I got a ride with a driver and didn't know how to drive, that's not God's fault. So that's I, a, I know, I'm just saying, but it's so uncommon for people to not go, why me? And where are you, God? And that, that's always uh, been, I thought, an interesting part of your, you know, of your life story. So so now you're, you're hurt, you're, you're burned. Um, of course, you've had a lot of reconstructive surgery. They've given you a nose again and ears and, and all this. And, I do. Well, I don't, I, see, I'm not figuring, I, see, you lost your nose. I'm not sure why mine is this way. You know, you, you had one and I, and I got nothing. Uh, but they reconstructed everything up on you. Um, you're laying, but before that, you know, you're laying in the hospital. What was your life plan? You know, you've been burned up, you've lost your arms. Well, uh, to go back to what you were saying before, do I blame God? And no, I have never doubted God uh, in any way. And that's what I, I thank Him for everything that He's given me. And up to that point, even... So I am. He gave me an awful lot. Uh, otherwise, I'd have been six feet under. Yeah. You know, people come up all the time. That just doesn't happen just occasionally. But all the time, people will come up to you four or five times a year, probably, and say thank you. Just, just for big you. I thought I had problems, but if you can handle your problems, I, I have no problems. And so, to thank you very much, just, just for being me. You know, just think about this idea of how, how God has used it. You said something to me one time. Um, you said a lot of things that I remember really well. And one of the things you said to me was you said, um, you know, it's made me a better man. That, that the accident made you a better man. How's that? Well, I don't thought I would be otherwise. I mean, you yeah, often wonder if you, what, what road you go down. But uh, before, I was, like I say, I was a sailor, and I was doing my best to live up to a sailor's reputation. <laughs> And uh, so I don't know whether I kept on that road or not, but uh, after being injured and what have you, I, and uh, like I say, just by being an example uh, many times to others, uh, I think I'm probably a better man than I would have been in any other way. And you ask me, would I change anything? No, at this point I would not. If you asked me a couple of months after the accident, I'd probably, yeah, I'd like to go back yeah. and take that ride back. <laughs> yeah. You were alluding to that, that you had, you had shared with me. Another thing that I really remember was, um, I asked you one time when I was a young guy, I was like, well, would, you know, would you take it back? Would you do it different? And, uh, and you said that you wouldn't, that you wouldn't avoid, you wouldn't have avoided the accident. Why? No, because I know what I have now. And I have good family. I have good, I have been married. Had a good family, good uh, grandchildren, everything. I mean, I couldn't ask for but if everyone has half as good a life as I have had, then I don't think anyone has any complaints at all. So no, I, I wouldn't change anything. Yeah, that's it's a, it's a great life. That's superhuman. Yeah, that's superhuman. What do you expect from your dad, though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every son should feel that way about his dad. How do I say goodbye to what we had? The good times that made us laugh outweighed the bad. I thought we'd get to see forever, but forever has blown away. It's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. These are the immortal words of the prophet's boys to men. <laughs> Um, how? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just spend a little bit of time trying to do the best I can to answer the question, how? How does a man come to this perspective about this ordeal in his life and live a life well lived as he did? I've been preaching for... The 20 year mark's coming up sooner than I think, and this is the first time that I can remember being nervous in a very long, long time. When Chuck, yeah, she just said, <laughs> Chuck just said, good. Uh, 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 because uh, 
Gene Gerwig, and I only ever called him Mr. Gerwig, so it's, it's strange for me to keep referring to him as Gene this evening, be only because Chuck insists, you know, that the formality would have driven his father crazy. Uh, but I had such a tremendous prof and profound respect for Mr. Gerwig. Part of that is, is my military background uh, uh, intersects with, uh, with his as a military man. And so Mr. seemed appropriate. Um, uh, the other thing is, is just what I had known about him and had come to know about him. I, I felt like I, I had no business calling him Gene at any point. In fact, the, the first time I met him, he tried to put me at ease. It was on a motorcycle trip down to his place. We stayed the night at his place to have a cigar. And the first time I met him, <coughs> He was asking me about my motorcycle and, you know, does it handle well? I said, well, no, not particularly. And he says, well, you know, what do you like about it? And I said, well, it's, it's a bad out of hell on a straight line. I really love, I really love my bike. And he says, okay, dark meat, hand over the keys. Let me give it a spin. <laughs> now, I know he was married to a Puerto Rican woman, so I know he's having a little bit of fun with me. And I look at Chuck and I'm like, am I supposed to hand him the keys? <laughs> uh, and you know, he, he wanted to put me, I, I think, really comfortable in his home right away, which was extremely generous of him. Uh, and he had, he had more fun at my expense the longer that I got. But he, and he was not a man as evidenced by the testimony of everyone here that just survived this life. I think most people, given the same circumstances at the same time, would just try and survive this life, and that's not what he did. He did not just survive this life. Given everything that happened and all that he was and where he came from, he found a way to thrive, not just survive, in spite of his circumstances. How? I'm going to, if you have a Bible, you're, you're welcome to turn to 1 Thessalonians, which is where I'm going to read from, or if you have an app or even an internet browser on your phone. Uh, I'm going to turn to this book, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm going to read it to you because I think it helps us answer the question. I do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of a trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord, to always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Okay. Death, for most people, bring at least two things, I suppose. First, ambiguity. Ambiguity about what death means. You know, the idea of being an atheist gets a lot of press, but it gets very few followers in moments like this. An ambiguity about about purpose, about hope, about meaning. It brings despair for some. The loss of a relationship, someone we love, of someone who we are connected to. <clears throat> but for those who are convinced about Jesus, Paul writing to a very complicated place called Thessalonica, uh, he, he, he sets out to clear the air. Something has happened 
The church there is grieving. And Paul says, I want to bring something to the conversation here. I need you to all understand that for those who are convinced about Jesus, death brings something else that the rest of the world knows nothing of. And by my count, there are at least, at least four things that death brings for those who are convinced about Jesus. Look at verse 13. It says this. But we do not want you to be uninformed. The first thing for those convinced about Jesus, who know Jesus, who understand the gospel, death brings clarity. Paul's saying it right here. I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to have anything that even smells or reeks of speculation. Okay, so there are two words, speculation, revelation. Speculation begins with us. Revelation begins with God. For the rest of the world, death brings a whole lot of speculation or wishful thinking at best about what's next, about what this means, about what it says about the universe, Every religion, at best, is speculation. It is man's attempt to understand God and to understand this world. But Paul says, I don't want you to be informed because you have been given revelation. Revelation starts with God and moves towards man. The idea here being that God wants to be known. And God wants you to know how to live this life. He is not trying to hide those things or mask those things from anyone. He wants you to know what you can take away from something painful and something hard, including death. So number one, at minimum, death brings clarity. Number two, the second half of verse 13 reads this. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may grieve as others do who have no hope. Death, for those convinced about Jesus, for those that know who he is, for those that understand his gospel, death brings conviction. Now, the first thing Paul does here is he makes a distinction. Now, we have trouble today making distinctions. We don't like to make distinctions because we feel like in making distinctions, we somehow leave someone out. But for a very long time, the culture has always understood that our ability as a people to make distinctions is the way that conviction is formed. You have to create distinctions in order to produce conviction, meaning yeah, I believe that because I've been singled out from those who don't or vice versa. So, for example, we understand that distinctions can be helpful, like there are those who are disabled or less abled, like Gene and my son. And then there are others. There are those from SoCal. And then there are others. <laughs> I'm a Southern California native for the record. There are those who ride Harley Davidsons, and then there are others. You understand? You see what he's doing here? He's making a distinction. He's saying there are those who have hope in death. There are others. There are those of us in this world who face grief and we have no place to put it. You ever try getting off a motorcycle without putting a kickstand down? <laughs> without a place to put the motorcycle, it's going to be a bad day. It's going, the day is going to spiral. Well, that's what happens with grief. When you don't have a place to put grief, it gets worse 
and it spirals because it has no resting place, it has no landing place, it has no boundary, it has nothing to prop it up. And the point here that Paul is making is, for you, Christian, don't grieve that way. Don't mourn that way. You still grieve, but it has boundaries. It has a place to put it. It has a shelf to rest it on. There is a landing place for this grief, and that landing place is fulfilled in, is found in, this guy named Jesus. Don't grieve like the rest of the world, because you're not like the rest of the world. And so we need to make these distinctions. Because when we make distinctions, we find out what people are made out of. And speculation is grounded in ourselves, so it's shaky at best, right? So if we're just speculating as to what this all means, as to what this life means, as to what death means, as to what purpose means, we somewhere deep inside, I believe, know that that is a shaky premise because anything based on us is shaky. But Jesus, there's a reason he refers to himself as a rock, as a firm foundation. He says, I can take the weight of your grief. Put the kickstand down here. Verse 14 goes on. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, which is just a, a metaphor for those who have died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, that's all of you, who are left until the coming of the Lord, not like left behind all weird, okay? Like, don't, it's not like, you know, the guy from Growing Pains. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and then we'll be caught up in the air with him. Death brings clarity, death brings conviction, and for those of you convinced about Jesus, it brings hope. Now, as far as I can tell, there are at least two ways that Paul is grounding a person's hope in the face of death. Us, left behind in the face of death. He says, one, in what Jesus has done, and two, in what Jesus is going to do. What has he done? Well, the first thing he did is Jesus died. You have to understand what a profound act that is for Gene to look at his mother and say, I'll take the punishment to set him free, is immersed in the gospel. We can't be free without someone perfect in our place, in our stead, dying the death we're supposed to die so that we can then later die the death that we want to die, which is where there's an eternity behind it. Jesus died the idea of that death is that sin's penalty is gone. What's sin? Sin is not this behavior. Sin is this latent, intrinsic, infused reality <coughs> in a world in rebellion to God that we can escape from through Jesus' death. The second thing he has done is he rose again. So if his death dealt with sin's penalty, then his resurrection has dealt with sin's power over you to live differently. By a show of hands, who thinks
Jean Gerwig lived differently. That's resurrection kind of power. It allows me to give grace when I normally can't give grace. It allows me to extend mercy and forgiveness and generosity. It allows me to be humble when I am intrinsically not humble. It allows me to do things that I cannot do in and of myself because in resurrection there is triumph over what cannot be triumphed over otherwise. So we need both death to deal with the penalty of sin and we need resurrection to deal with its power. Death brings also not just hope in what Jesus has done, but in what Jesus will do. Uh, he says here in Thessalonians that one day Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rule and reign over this place. Now let me tell you why that's good news. Because when he does, and historically that's been referred to as the second advent of Christ, meaning the first advent, the first time he came, and then there's the second advent, which is the next time he is coming. Here's the big idea of Jesus coming back one day. The first time I came, I dealt with sin's penalty and power. Death and resurrection. The next time I come, I'm going to deal with its presence. A world in which every eye will be dry and every wrong will be righted. That is the universe and the world in which Gene Gerwig currently is in. Because verse 18 says this, therefore encourage one another with these words. I guess the last thing we're gonna end with here is that death brings encouragement. Now how is that possible? Well, two ways. First, for us, I'm gonna read from you from this other book, 2 Corinthians chapter four. Verse 16. Do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self, Christian, is being renewed day by day. Now here's the verse I want you to catch. For this light and momentary affliction, which is this life, Gene's life, here on this earth, this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. How can it be light and momentary? Well, it's light because glory weighs more than cancer. Glory weighs more than divorce. Glory weighs more than burns. So in comparison, the burden that he was asked to carry, he realized it was light. Well, how can it be momentary? He lived almost his whole life this way because eternity is longer than chemo. Eternity is longer than counseling. So by comparison, this life is momentary. And so here's kind of what God is saying. Joel 2.25, it's one of my favorite verses in the whole wide world to, to quote. Listen to this. Every time I read it, there's always like, Half the room goes, I've never heard that verse. <coughs> Joel 2.25. This is the idea. Is that in death, that God, because he is good, restores and sets all things right in the end. And so we can endure anything <laughs> in the present 
as a result, and this is only possible for those convinced about Jesus, who know Jesus, and who understand his gospel. Everyone else is others, and they are speculating at best. No hooks, but hands. No burns, but beauty. No tears, just treasure remains. When you trust Jesus, even something as painful as death can bring clarity and conviction and hope and encouragement, something that Jean Gerwig lived an entire life aware of. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lay down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me, because you prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies, even in the presence of pain, even in the presence of suffering, even in the presence of hardship, you anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs full. Surely, goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life because I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.
together this evening to celebrate the life of a good man, Gene Gerwig. And while he has stepped over the threshold of eternity to a place where uh, all has been set right, where all that the locust has stolen has been paid forward in full, we are left behind to grieve, but we do not grieve. If we know Jesus as others grieve, Lord, we have a place to, to rest our grief, to place our despair. We trust you and commend to you uh, all that has been done through and in Gene, even in death. And so in his death, Lord, I pray that for those of us gathered here this evening, that you would bring clarity, not speculation, but revelation, God, that you want us to know you and that you want us to know how to live, that you want us to look at the sum total of our lives and not fret over, are there more that I would relive or are there, is there more that I regret? but that we could have confidence, that we could have assurance about our lives somehow. And that, Lord, that you would bring conviction that that can only be realized, that assurance can only be known in and through you as our God. Particularly that it brings hope in and through Jesus Christ who died for us substituting himself, 
paying a ransom, paying a debt that we could not pay ourselves, and the penalty that was due to us has been removed. The sting of death has been taken. Eternity has been recovered for us, not apart from God before Jesus, but with God because of him. In his resurrection, we are winning the war against sin's power over us. We live new lives as new people who have been raised with our new Savior. And we look forward to the hope of what Jesus will do when he returns and delivers us from sin's presence, where all that is hard and all that is awful, every injustice, every pain will be taken away. In fact, the Bible says, Lord, that we won't even remember it. I pray that you bring encouragement to everyone this evening that their affliction is light and momentary thanks to Jesus, pending eternity that is weighty and eternal. Lord, we're thankful for his life and that it has brought us together, if nothing else, to model, to mirror, to image, not just how to survive this life, but how to thrive in spite of all circumstances, and particularly for Jean, because of Jesus, whose name we pray in. Amen. The family invites you to stay, to laugh, to eat, uh, all at Chuck's expense. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, at some point, I'm going to assume someone will throw you out. Um, uh, if not, uh, there's a place to sleep in the back. Uh, thank you all for being here.